All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, and or for waiting around <laughs> for a little while while we got our time change um, figured out. But um, but here we go. Uh, we're so excited to have you here um, to speak with or to listen and participate with one of our colleagues from DIS, which is a, a third party provider program that we partner with here at Ohio State. So um, I guess just to back up, I'm Rebecca McMunn. I work here at Ohio State in the Education Abroad Office and am kind of the liaison for um, DIS and send, help send students each semester um, when we are able to do so. So I am excited to have my colleague and you all here today to speak with us. Um, and again, are very excited. It looks like several of you are popping back on here. So we're excited to have you. Um, and also to have this recording to share. So with that, I will hand it over to Manuel to get us started. Yes, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, sorry about the, the problem with the timing. I was just in class before on another Zoom class. So uh, you would probably hear from my accent that I'm not uh, uh, an English uh, native. I'm actually uh, originally from France, but I've been living in Denmark for many years and I've been an employee of uh, DIS uh, study abroad program uh, for the last seven years. So I'm, I've prepared a, a couple of, um, well, quite a few slides and exercises. The idea is that uh, we are going to uh, uh, give you a little bit of uh, insight on how to determine uh, the impact of uh, our food system on, on environments. So I'm going to share with you, uh, I'm gonna share with you my screen. And of course, I've heard that you are able to ask questions. So please, I cannot see you, but uh, you can hear me and see me. So if you want to have question, uh, just unmute your mic. And um, something is not working properly. Oh, yes. Can you see my screen right now? Perfect. Okay, so this is a kind of uh, my little, uh, uh, I, uh, I stopped using PowerPoint uh, about uh, 10 years ago and I've been using this uh, wonderful tool called Prezi and this is my kind of a uh, teaching environment. So what we try to do uh, when uh, our students are, are with us is that um, uh, I created this little uh, menu style environment to talk about food sustainability and today we're going to talk about a, a very small thing. I have a Hold on a sec. Yes, okay. Right, so uh, the objective of today is really to try to get a better uh, handle on um, the environmental impact of, of food. So the, we're gonna go through two objectives. One is gonna be going through the, the basics of uh, the environmental impact of food. So try to get a better understanding of how we do that and then uh, we'll try to do some exercise to try to evaluate uh, the environmental impact of food and try to relate uh, different uh, uh, food products uh, using doing a small exercise. So uh, again, if you do have any question, please uh, either write them into the uh, into the chat, um, or I think you can also uh, uh, speak up. But I, I guess we can use the the, the chat room. Okay. So. Um, Two seconds. Right. As you know, uh, uh, the environmental impact of uh, food for the whole uh, globe is quite uh, an important contributor to climate change. And I've been teaching this kind of a uh, class for many years and uh, my previous uh, knowledge and data about this was that maybe uh, roughly a quarter of our greenhouse gases uh, was, was uh, attributed to the, the food that we are uh, producing on Earth. But actually, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, in March, uh, there was a new update that has been made that it's not 25% of our global uh, greenhouse gas emission that are contributing to climate change attributed to, to food, but 30%, which is not a good news, of course. Uh, it's even worse than we uh, actually feared. I just put a couple of references here. You have one uh, reference from the Food and uh, Agriculture Organization, the FAO, which is a UN uh, body. And then you have the original research piece on the bottom uh, written by uh, Nature. Okay, so 
the reason why I'm putting that as a first uh, slide is just to inform, I mean, just to remind ourselves that, uh, yes, uh, the food that we eat every day, the choice that we make when we are buying food every day, has a big impact on the climate. It has also many other impacts. Uh, uh, the, the other very, very big impact associated with the production and consumption of food uh, around the globe, uh, whether it's in the US, uh, in France, in Denmark, uh, in India, in China, wherever we are, uh, is uh, biodiversity. We are not going to talk about biodiversity. It would require another hour uh, to, uh, to talk about that very briefly. Uh, so I'm going to focus today on, on the climate impact of the food that we are producing and we are eating. So um, let's try to go a little bit more into it. So the typical type of question that you uh, people might want to uh, understand when they're looking at the impact of food is uh, trying to compare. Uh, is a banana better than an orange from a climate perspective only? Huh? I'm uh, focusing only. We have uh, many other environmental impacts. I think uh, climate is one of the, the, the most uh, urgent issue and more, most global issue that we need to address. Uh, so that's why I'm focusing this uh, on this today. So uh, we can ask, uh, is chicken better than beef? Uh, we can say, we can ask ourselves, is imported avocados uh, better than eating local corn uh, or tomatoes or whatever? Uh, what is the highest impact? Is it uh, our agricultural system or is it the transport of the food to take the food uh, and cross uh, the, the Atlantic Ocean uh, to bring the food here like uh, almond, for example, are being imported from California uh, to, to Denmark, for example. So, is it uh, the shipping that is the most important? Is it the packaging that is the most important? Is it the production on the agricultural side that is the most important? Um, so all these kind of things, we need to find some answers. And uh, one of the, there are some methods behind that. And uh, what we're going to do today is uh, give you some, uh, some insight about that. Right. So, um, okay. So when you're looking at a, uh, at the environmental impact of uh, food, or it can also be uh, of a particular product. It could be uh, the, the impact of a toy. It could be, uh, I have a lot of teaching aid on my, because this is my classroom. Uh, we, we can look at the environmental impact of a, of a bottle of milk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, every time that you're trying to evaluate the environmental impact of a particular product or services, uh, you have a tool called life cycle assessment. And this concept is a method, it's an international method that has been developed um, 25 years ago now, maybe 30 years ago. And it's quite complex, but the idea of tonight is just to give you a, um, an overview of what that means. And when you understand the, the graph that you have in front of you, uh, you understand pretty much most of what you have to understand about life cycle assessment. The rest of it is just subtraction and addition and rather large uh, databases, and you use all kinds of software to help you to do that. But basically, the, the, the basic concept about uh, understanding the environmental impact of anything we do in society is to try to break it down in smaller pieces. And this is called life cycle assessment. So we're going to start on the top left. And so basically, on the top left, you have what we call resource extraction. And resource extraction sounds uh, a little bit like mining and all these kind of things. So yes, it includes uh, mineral extraction that is going to be taken for other things in society. We are going to leave that uh, aside for today. The other is to be able to extract uh, agricultural resource, biomass, uh, forestry products, et cetera, et cetera, from our environment. Uh, and then we're going to take that, basically. And then we are going to potentially transform it. We're going to clean it. We're going to do all kinds of things. So we have uh, this kind of uh, long cycle. Actually, I show it to you as a cycle, but today in our society, we have a very linear system. So we take, we make, and we dispose. And this is exactly what, what it's uh, shown here. So you, you start by extracting the resources, and then these resources needs to be uh, manufactured. So you will go and they will be put into a production site. It will have uh, different uh, level of complexity, depending on the type of uh, food product that we are talking about. But every time that you have a different uh, life cycle stage, uh, you are emitting some emission and that has an impact on the environment. 
Uh, so we just imagine that you have a production. So just imagine it's like a big factory and you put uh, some kind of food product on one end and then you get other type of uh, manufactured goods on the other end. Uh, that would involve all kind of uh, packaging. This would involve also later on the distribution because you have to uh, get the food uh, produced. We're talking about industrial system here. Uh, and then it has to be going all the way to the supermarkets that you and I are going every day to, to buy our food. So um, this is the, the third quarter that we, we call the distribution part of the life cycle. So here you have to imagine that for food, it can be extremely complex. It involves uh, warehouses. It involves uh, all kind of packaging necessary to distribute the food without getting uh, too much uh, waste. Um, and every time you go and you try to distribute food, you will have some kind of impact. If you have to uh, transport uh, some uh, potato in a truck, uh, this uh, impact associated with the transport of the potato in that truck will have to be accounted for. You imagine you could have a, a train, you could have a plane, you could have a ship. All this will have a different uh, environmental impact. Uh, and uh, mostly uh, we'll have a different CO2 impact associated with the transport and the distribution of this. You, so you have all this and it can be extremely complex. And then you have all kinds of warehouses and then it will go and be distributed to all the supermarket. And then uh, each of us will uh, probably uh, take a, a car and go uh, every week or five times a week uh, to the supermarket. And that has also an impact. And it's also either part of the distribution or more likely part of the use phase. So you are, when you are buying food, you take your vehicle and you buy that food, but you also do other things. So the distribution can be in the food uh, manufacturing uh, distribution can be extremely complex. And to add to the level of complexity and to the level of uh, impact, you have to think also that a lot of the food that is uh, distributed around the world today uh, also includes uh, the necessity to transport food uh, in a refrigerated state. So you need to cool the food. If you are transporting fish, for example, if you're transporting beef, for example, uh, you need to refrigerate the whole supply chain all the way to the, to the supermarket. And then you need to make sure that you put it into your own fridge uh, when you are at home, if you want to preserve this for a little bit longer. So you just start to understand a bit the complexity that uh, we can see in uh, just getting the food from a field all the way to, the, to your uh, plate. Then we have what we call the, the use phase or utilization. And sorry, it's written in British English. It's not a spelling mistake, but in, in England, we put it with an S. In the US, it's with a Z. Um, and the use phase is uh, uh, also uh, could be potentially quite uh, impactful. Uh, we have um, not only uh, in this cycle, we not, don't only have uh, impact on climate, but we also have uh, wastage at different uh, stage of this, uh, of this uh, system. But at the use phase, you have a, uh, for, for the food, you have to imagine that uh, you might have to transform the food, you might waste uh, the peeling, for example. All this will have an, an impact, and we can quantify that. Today, uh, the food that we don't eat uh, end up uh, in the trash. And of course, you imagine you have a truck picking up the trash and all this stuff, and all this has to be quantified as well. So, um, this life cycle assessment is basically used. Um, it's been used a lot in academic circles, but it's used increasingly uh, by the industry to try to understand where are their biggest impact and try to kind of uh, reduce. And of course, we, we are all aware about this uh, uh, issue of, uh, of climate change. Maybe we are not all aware about the urgency of addressing climate change, uh, but I can tell you it's a pretty urgent thing. We need to move on fast and we need to have a better understanding of the impact that our food system is producing. Remember, 30% of all the food we produce for human consumption is responsible for the climate problem that we are facing today. Right, okay. So we, we do this kind of uh, uh, analysis to uh, try to uh, get an understanding of this uh, all this environmental uh, impact. And we try to put that in a in a way so we can communicate that to other people. Um, it's kind of used at different scale and different level. It's used uh, at the policy level. Uh, you imagine the uh, 
uh, US EPA is using uh, life cycle assessment for, for many years. Uh, other uh, government body are using uh, this uh, technology, this method. Uh, you, you can, it can help you to shape a better policy. It can uh, help you to most importantly communicate. Uh, sometimes it's rather complex, but we ended up with a small number and we can try to kind of uh, share that. And of course, there is a lot of research. But one of the interests of using this uh, methodology is that uh, maybe in the future, it's not there yet because it's a little bit complex, but we, in the future, we'll be able to uh, have a, a way to label that in a supermarket. And then the, the people like you and me going into the supermarket, maybe they could scan a tag or something that is on the, on the food and then uh, try to identify the uh, carbon impact or the carbon price of uh, that particular uh, food item. Uh, that is not yet happening, unfortunately. Okay, this is just a, a very brief overview of uh, what I said uh, before. It's a linear process, it's just exactly the same. Uh, if you remember this type of aspect, uh, you are actually understood pretty much uh, maybe half of the whole idea of life cycle assessment, which enables you to quantify the environmental impact of the food that we are producing. I'm not going to repeat that. There is uh, something uh, um, that I would like to, um, to share with you, but uh, I'm not going to dwell too much. This is just uh, additional information. Um, the life cycle assessment is based on a, on a framework uh, that is an international standard. So whether you are in the US, whether you are in Denmark, whether you're in the in the UK, uh, anywhere in the world, in India, uh, you have a, a system with the same methodology to help you to be able to compare and communicate uh, between different countries. I'm not going to, like I said, I'm not going to go too much into the details of that. Um, I will leave that uh, for you and I can leave a, a link uh, and then you can uh, dig a little bit deeper in, into that uh, if you want to. Uh, just to give a little bit more um, to give you some additional uh, explanation, I just want to give you an example of the tomato, okay? Tomato is a really cool product to look at because tomato is uh, known by all of us and it's transformed in so many different type of products and, um, and therefore it's a great way to illustrate uh, how useful life cycle assessment can be in quantifying the climate impact and other environmental impacts of a particular food product. So let's uh, have a look at the uh, example here. Okay, so uh, basically when you are doing a life cycle assessment, you try to uh, break down a complex process in smaller processes along the five uh, categories that I mentioned before, extraction, production, distribution, use, and, and waste. And then you have, it's a bit like a black box type of thing. So you try to uh, make an inventory of all the things that are necessary to make a tomato uh, grow and to, to have a, a tomato. So you will need some uh, water from the irrigation. You will need some kind of energy. Just imagine that it's not only the tomato in your back garden that you are doing on your own. We are talking about industrial scale uh, tomato uh, a field, a completely full uh, uh, of tomatoes, uh, completely uh, automat uh, not automatized, but uh, mechanized uh, agriculture we're talking about. So we need a lot of trucks. Uh, we need a lot of tractors. We need a lot of agricultural machinery, which is powered by fossil fuel for most of, the, for most of them around the world. And all this um, energy, of course, is necessary. To, so you, we need to know how much energy has been used in order to grow your tomato. And then you will have what we call the ancillary product. And the ancillary product, we have to think of the fertilizer that we need to put on a tomato to get our tomato to grow faster. Uh, we need to put some pesticide, maybe if we don't grow organic uh, tomato. Uh, and all this, of course, will have a climate impact. So the more um, fertilizer you put, the more climate impact you will generate. The more pesticide that you put in on your tomato, not only it will kill the bugs uh, and will grow your tomato better and will kill all the disease associated in your tomato, it will also, uh, you need to manufacture this uh, pesticide and this will have also a contribution to, to climate change. So uh, that's on the left inside of, of the screen that you see right in front of you. 
And then on the right hand side, you have to look at everything that is being uh, uh, emitted. So you have to, uh, ov obviously you want to make a tomato. So product is the tomato is, is, is pretty necessary. That's the reason why you put all this stuff together. But you have to also account for uh, all the emission into the air. And if, uh, if you were able to talk to me right now, I, I would ask you what type of air emission you could, uh, you could think of. And uh, I would uh, answer uh, that, of course, CO2 is one of them, but you will have hundreds of other type of uh, emission to the air, to the water courses, and, and to the soil. So basically, any kind of industrial process of growing any kind of food uh, will be associated with a certain amount of air pollution, a certain amount of water pollution, and a certain amount of soil pollution. What we try to do with this uh, life cycle assessment is we try to quantify that so we get a better uh, uh, understanding of whether uh, a tomato is better or worse than a banana, for example, in terms of a climate perspective. So let's try to, to break down the production, of, um, the production of tomato on an industrial scale. So we, we start looking at the extraction level. So this is when you are in the field. So here again, you start, you try to break down in the smaller pieces uh, your um, your food production. And here we have the example of, of tomato. So of course you have to make sure that you have uh, seeds. So you have entire company that will uh, make sure that they have the best seeds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have a uh, seed production that also has an impact. By the way, we need to consider the quantity of fertilizer. Uh, needed to grow this uh, tomato. We need to understand, uh, get a better understanding of uh, the amount of pesticide associated with this uh, uh, production. And uh, as I explained, the more pesticide, the more impact. And then this pesticide will not only have an impact on, uh, on air emission, but it will also potentially uh, um, contaminate watercourses, rivers, and all this we need to kind of uh, uh, quantify, evaluate. Uh, we need some irrigations. So in some countries, you can just depend on, uh, on rainwater. In Denmark, it rains uh, quite a bit. But uh, so you would uh, uh, need just rainwater. But in many places, you need additional irrigation because rainwater is not sufficient. So you need to have uh, all kind of uh, pumping mechanism. And all this will require energy to, um, to make that uh, tomato grow. You can also uh, imagine that uh, you can grow your tomato in the greenhouse, and that would also have all kind of uh, different uh, impact associated with that. Uh, okay, so now you get the gist of, of this uh, of this method. Uh, you have some input, and then you have some uh, output in the form of uh, environmental emission. I'm just going to go a, a little bit uh, faster here, but uh, you could ask uh, yourself. Uh, is it better to grow a tomato in a field or in a greenhouse uh, if we are interested on the climate question? Is it better for the environment to grow your tomato in a field or is it better for the environment to grow your tomato in a greenhouse? So you can ask all kinds of questions and this life cycle assessment methods will help you to give you some kind of quantitative answer to that. So you don't have to just guess and just imagine what is the answer. Uh, so, for example, if you were to use a greenhouse, you can make the question a little bit more complex and you say, okay, is that greenhouse uh, warmed? And if it's warmed, uh, what kind of fuel is, is it used to, to warm that uh, greenhouse? Uh, do you uh, enrich the air inside that greenhouse with a CO2 um, to in enhance the growth of, of that plant? Uh, that will also have an effect on the total climate impact of, of, the, of your production. And so on and so forth. I, I, I left you uh, a few minutes to read uh, the rest of the question. But basically, the number of questions are pretty much endless. OK. Um, now let's move to production. Uh, and production here is interesting because uh, this is something that you, I, I was a, a consultant, uh, an environmental consultant, and I was working a lot. Uh, on trying to help uh, my clients to uh, uh, try to mitigate the environmental impact of their production. And uh, I did a little bit of work and then you, you start to realize that it's actually a very, very, very large industry. And then you have uh, this kind of uh, production. So you just imagine this big truckload uh, full of tomatoes. 
and they arrive in these very large factories. And then uh, you need to first uh, power this factory. And of course, this will have an impact. But you will have all kinds of activities, like uh, if uh, uh, you have uh, um, traditional um, conventional growing of tomato, you will need a lot of pesticide. If you don't want your customer to eat the pesticide, you need to wash this tomato pretty well. So you have a whole kind of gigantic uh, washing machine that are used to, uh, to clean up the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the tomato. If you were to use organic uh, tomato, you would lose uh, much less uh, energy in washing it. You would still wash it because you need to remove the, the, the soil and all that stuff, but it, you could probably uh, use uh, less uh, washing and less energy to do that, uh, that washing. You then uh, imagine that you have to transform and you see all the product that you can make with a tomato. You can make tomato soup, you can make uh, uh, gazpacho, you can make uh, tomato ketchup, the most uh, that's the stuff that my kids love and nothing else. Uh, you can make uh, can and tin tomatoes. You can make also tomatoes in a box that you eat fresh and uh, at home. When these tomatoes are transformed into a big factory, uh, uh, you have to uh, remove the peeling, remove, uh, you have a lot of waste generated and all this stuff needs to be accounted for in terms of the emission. You, you get a, the overall picture of that, uh, of that system. Now, if you want to distribute, if you want to distribute it, you have to imagine that you need it to put uh, this, you need to protect uh, your product and you use uh, quite a lot of packaging. So you need also to have an understanding of the environmental impact associated with the packaging. And of course, different type of packaging will have a different environmental impact. Uh, here, if we were, uh, if you were uh, uh, just being able to uh, to kind of uh, respond back to me, uh, back and forth, we would, I would ask you, Okay, what kind of uh, packaging do you identify here? How many type of packaging would you identify here? And here is just a, a very simple question. But actually, when you try to answer that, you realize that not only you have here, you have a plastic uh, uh, box, uh, but you have also a cardboard box here. You have a bigger cardboard box here. All these uh, cardboard boxes full of tomatoes are stacked on top of each other, and they are themselves on a pallet. All this seems to be all uh, evident to, to, to you and me, but basically when you are doing this life cycle assessment, when you're trying to evaluate the environmental impact of your food, you need to uh, account for all of that. And then I told you uh, before, uh, you have uh, potentially a big uh, refrigerated warehouses full of this tomato where this is stored. And then you have to transport it in a truck or other means. So you, you get a, a picture of uh, the different type of uh, complexity associated with something as simple as tomatoes. And then you have to think that it's the same for pretty much every kind of food product with different level of complexity, of course. Uh, then when we have to uh, use it, do you eat raw in a salad or do you cook it? The fact that you cook it, do you cook it with uh, using electricity or do you cook it using uh, natural gas? And all this will have a completely different in impact on, on the planet. And of course, if you eat it raw, uh, that's basically there's zero impact associated with the uh, with your tomato salad in, in that case. Obviously, there is some impact if you do not uh, eat everything and some of it is wasted, then that will have an impact uh, on the environment. Um, okay. Uh, oops, sorry. I just wanted to briefly talk to you about the waste part. Uh, do you know, guys, how much uh, waste uh, are we generated from the total amount of uh, food that we produced in the US, how much is wasted? I'm, I'm uh, waiting for you uh, to have an answer on a chat. Or unmute if you prefer. I would love to hear your voice. I would even love to uh, watch your face, but uh, that's not uh, working today. OK. Um, Anybody here? Okay, I've, I have a bit of a feeling that I'm talking on my to to myself, but uh, uh, yes. So basically, the answer is uh, forty percent of the food produced 
around uh, the world and in the US in specifically is uh, wasted in a billion. And that's something that needs to be, to be, uh, to be addressed. Uh, and that's basically just to give you an example of the tomato we were talking before. Uh, you have uh, some that is uh, wasted uh, in, uh, in the field, some that is uh, wasted um, uh, while you are processing uh, your tomato. You have quite a bit, but not that much actually, uh, wasted at the supermarket. Uh, we are all uh, guilty, you and me, uh, to have uh, some uh, wasted products uh, at home where we don't manage to eat the whole thing in time and then things get bad and then we just throw it away. And then some of it gets uh, dumped into, into a, a landfill site. Um, okay. I'm going to skip that. It's not very interesting. It's just to show you that some people have been actually doing this kind of work. And a lot of it is available for um, a lot of it is available for um, in databases and in software. So you can you don't have to redo everything. You can just use a computer, right? So uh, that's pretty much it. We can uh, have a look now at the food impact, and uh, basically. Uh, what is very interesting is that uh, when you use all these life cycle assessments, some people have been uh, compiling all these uh, life cycle assessment that has been done all around the world. And this, this guy, these uh, two scientists have been uh, uh, collecting all this and been compiling them and putting them in a big, big database to try to compare the different food product and a different impact. And what, what we see here is that you have a, a massive difference between um, the most impactful uh, food to the least impactful. And there is a big, big range. And uh, that's something that um, we should uh, be much more aware when we are buying the food on a daily basis. Just to give you an example of this graph that you are more than welcome to, to download and uh, have uh, somewhere near, if you're interested in the impact of, of food, is to uh, click to this link called All World in Data. You have um, uh, basically some kind of um, an overview of the work that has been done. And that's just a, a, a picture of what um, this is all about. Just a few uh, key messages that I took out of this. Uh, when you look at uh, this, you have, uh, it's quite clear for most of us, but it's important to, to see that again. Uh, Plant-based food is 10 to 15, 50 times better than animal-based food. So here I'm not telling uh, all of you to become a vegetarian. I'm just uh, asking you to be a lot more mindful when you are uh, making a decision three times a day and buying food. Uh, I think uh, one of the biggest myths is about this idea of uh, local food. Actually, it does not really matter where your food comes from. Uh, it uh, matter what type of food you're eating. And uh, I, I want to explain that a little bit. I still believe that eating local is, is greater, is better, but it, it's better because it provides a sense of community, it uh, generates revenue on a local scale and the local economy. Uh, but from a climate perspective, actually the uh, transport uh, of the food, it doesn't have a huge, um, uh, a huge impact. It's more the type of food that, that you're eating. So, uh, Packaging again, uh, both the transport of the food, uh, whether your food is uh, traveling uh, uh, long distance or not, that will not have a huge impact. Of course, uh, if you are transporting tomato from California to New York, this will have a bigger impact than if you were growing your tomatoes in New York, of course. Um, but on the overall scheme of things, on the overall life cycle perspective of a particular product, the uh, transport of the food has a very small impact. I can go back to my slide before, and you can see that uh, the transport, you see it's the, you have the uh, land use change. I will uh, explain that maybe a little bit later. You have the farm, uh, you have the type of feed that you use, you have the level of manufacturing that you are doing to your food, and the transport is the red part. If you look at the most impactful 
of us of all of the food products is beef, you see that the red, which is a transport, is that tiny little bit here. So again, it's very important to, to keep that in consideration when we're looking at that. Uh, I'm not saying that we should uh, not care about uh, eating local and all this. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the climate impact of transport of food has relatively a smaller uh, impact compared to the overall production of that food. Okay, and it's exactly the same logic for packaging. Even no, even though that we know that the packaging is a, has a massive impact on our. Um, uh, on our uh, ocean, uh, it's just accumulating everywhere. It's actually a very, very small uh, impact compared to the overall life cycle of a, of a particular product. Uh, this is, uh, the last one is more, more like a joke. Uh, on a kilo basis, it is actually uh, 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 more environmentally friendly from a climate perspective to eat uh, chicken than chocolate. Uh, it was, uh, you can do all these kind of things, but uh, uh, luckily, I don't. Uh, I still love chocolate, and I eat a relatively small amount, and that gives me great pleasure. So uh, now I wanted to uh, do an exercise, but I have a very little. Uh, excellent. I, I wanted to do an exercise here, um, Rebecca. So I don't know actually how I can do uh, an exercise if I don't have an audience responding back to me. How can I do that? Um, That's good. I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, to run the exercise and people will do it in their own, um, in their own time, right? Yes, and I, I'm happy to allow anyone and everyone to talk, so. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the idea was to have an interactive, as I indicated, I wanted you to uh, use your phone to, to have some kind of interaction. So it's hard to know whether you actually do that or not. So we are not going to do that. Uh, we're going to do it uh, the boring way. So, um, so the idea here was uh, to have uh, you to uh, have access to one database on one end, which gives you a, a lot of data with a lot of numbers. And then the exercise was, I'm going to stop sharing for a sec. So if you guys want to, uh, to use your phone, uh, you can uh, scan this QR code here, or you can uh, type uh, slido.com, and then you have the room called 115240. And I'm going to uh, stop my share right now. And I'm going to uh, go into my little so do you want me to send the link uh, on the chat or can they scan on the QR? The QR works for me, but it might be helpful to put it in the chat as well in case people didn't get their phones out in time. Okay, uh, and then the important, uh, I'm gonna send this link. Okay, and um, so basically the, you're going to be able, you should be able to have access to this. I'm going to share my screen. You should be able to see uh, this uh, information, sorry. You should be able to see this very boring long database, but actually it's one of the latest uh, work that has been done on almost a, a month ago. And it gives you, um, the environmental, the climate impact of 500 food products. And this is by far the biggest uh, climate database. And I, I, I hope that you can play with it. We're gonna do a couple of exercises. So now that you have all been, uh, you are all on the, on the Slido, I can see, hold on a sec. Uh, so I can see that some people have played. So we have five people online. So that, that's really cool, thank you. So um, now I will, uh, so a lot of you like uh, potatoes, other fried chicken. It was just a warm up uh, question. Okay, please, uh, please fill it up. Uh, maybe we can, uh, can you guys uh, see that on your screen? Uh, maybe Rebecca can give me a hint. Yeah, I can see on. it. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, so now, 
so we have eight people. Are we waiting for more people or not? Looks like we should have at least nine. Okay. Okay, well, uh, so the, 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 the small exercise here was uh, really to, uh, I'm going to start a quiz now and uh, uh, let's see what, uh, what come. Uh, so the idea here is that you should all have the database and you should basically look for the information and try to respond rather quickly on what is the uh, right answer. So let's get started. We have uh, four questions. Are you ready guys? One, two, three, let's go. So I'm going to start the quiz. Can you tell me? Okay, so what is the beverage with the lowest, the lowest carbon impact? So you have uh, instant coffee, uh, fresh coffee powder, apple juice, or soft drink. I could play a little music in the background, to, 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 but uh, no, okay. So uh, people have said uh, fresh coffee powder. Okay, ah, that's gonna be a hard one. Okay, we have some people changing. Okay, so fresh coffee powder. Powder. Uh, you have to obviously look, we should all get the right answer because you have to look at the database while I'm asking this question. So please um, uh, try to look a little bit. We should have a 100% agreement on, uh, so I don't know if you can modify your answer, maybe not. So the answer is, which surprised me to be honest. Uh, where is the, show the correct answer, okay. So soft drink. So you have to imagine that the level, uh, the, basically the Coca-Cola of this world is basically uh, water a lot of sugar, a little bit of gas, and that's pretty much it. And, and the economies of scale generated for making a, a soft drink is actually so large that uh, the environmental impact is relatively small per liter or per kilo or per unit of, of, uh, of soda. So the, the, what, is, what do you think is the, um, the highest impact? So the highest impact will be um, the instant coffee. You have to imagine that when you are uh, looking at instant coffee, you first you have to brew the coffee. The, first, you have to ground the coffee, energy. Uh, second, you have to brew the coffee. You have to make the coffee. And once you have your kettle full of coffee, you need to put it on a, on a, on a, on a hot plate, basically, to let the, all the water evaporate uh, to an extent where you have only a crystal of coffee which then you can uh, rehydrate re um, uh, at home with hot water, et cetera, et cetera. So the uh, instant coffee has the, by far the highest uh, climate impact. Okay, next question. Um, what is the alcoholic beverage with the highest climate impact? Is it beer, vodka, red wine, or cider? So again, you have to look at your uh, big climate database that gives you uh, an imp uh, information. Okay, we have one person answered. Uh, can we have more, please? That would be great. Excellent, yes. Okay. Okay, so, so excellent. Yeah, so the result is, of course, um, uh, vodka and the reason again is that uh, you are uh, you need to distill so if anybody knows how to make vodka uh, you know you need that to uh, to distill the alcohol in order to concentrate the alcohol that will require quite a significant amount of, uh, of energy uh, that will uh, be needed and that will have a climate impact okay next question uh, what is the animal protein with the lowest carbon impact is it chicken is it minced pork? Is it salmon or is it mussels? Hmm. I'm curious to know, to see. But if you if you use the database, you should have all 100% of the answer. Okay. Yes, very good. So the answer is mussels. And uh, Uh, sorry, you haven't finished all answering, but so, so yes, the answer is muscles. 
uh, and the, the big reason why the other animal protein uh, are have such a high impact on, on climate is because uh, uh, you need to feed this animal. And this animal, they don't live in nature and just uh, get a little bit of a, no, you need to, uh, to grow uh, the feed that will be uh, fed to this animal. And of course, if I put uh, beef here, that would have the, the highest impact. But mussel is basically something that you, you, you just uh, harvest uh, from the sea. And uh, it's basically filtering the food from the, from the sea and you don't need to add anything. If you were to uh, fish a salmon, for example, in the wild, that would also have uh, zero impact on, on climate, okay? So you have to imagine that the, the biggest impact of climate when you're looking at food product is how you make that food product uh, to the market. Is it something that you just harvest in the, in the environment or is it something that you have to fed, to feed, sorry, in order to have um, a better uh, a product, for, for example. Okay, final question. What is the food item uh, with the highest climate impact? Is it rice, potato, or pasta? And here again, if uh, you use the tool that I share with you, you should be able to answer uh, the, um, the answer correctly. I'm gonna wait a little bit. We have only two answers. Five answers, okay. Actually, I think I made a mistake. Ah, sorry, this is a mistake. Potato is the lowest impact. Sorry, I did that a bit quickly. Potato is the lowest impact. Uh, uh, apologies for that. And uh, yes, pasta, well done. Uh, it, no, sorry, it depends on the type of pasta. So you have to look, uh, the pasta that you chose is pasta that is mixed with other stuff. But the raw pasta is a lower impact. Anyway. Let's have a quick look at the, at the finish. Okay, ah, it's not anonymous. I can see all of the, uh, okay, great. Uh, okay, this is just a, a quick example, but it's a great exercise to start uh, because you know, you are uh, making a, a decision three times a day about the food that you're going to put in your mouth. And you might not uh, be the person buying it at the moment, but you will at some point in your life. Uh, this is quite uh, an interesting and an eye opener when you have to uh, uh, make a decision every day and then you start uh, calculating that and then you start multiplying that every day uh, over the whole year, three times a day. And then you start to add up. And I think, I think that's uh, one of the stuff that we try to, uh, to work on um, with my students here in, uh, in Copenhagen. We try to, to, try to uh, uh, increase our curiosity and um, uh, since uh, we are not all physically in uh, Copenhagen, uh, you know, you could be here, but I, I would uh, urge you uh, to uh, ask, uh, I know that Christmas is a bit far away, but uh, I would uh, suggest that you have a quick look. I don't know if you can read that like this. It's called How Bad Are Bananas? And this is the second uh, version of the book. So it has been updated quite recently. And it's uh, super interesting because it gives you not only the different impact of everyday stuff uh, regarding food, but it's also looking at every things that we do in our everyday life. So uh, uh, spending time on the phone, uh, spending time on a computer, having a big TV, a small TV, having one car, two cars, having uh, all kind of uh, uh, what is the impact? Uh, is it better to have uh, leather shoes or uh, um, tennis shoes or whatever. You have all these kind of things here. It's super interesting, a great uh, Christmas gift for, for all of you guys. So, um, uh, okay, I'm going to share my screen for the last few minutes that we have together. Um, if anybody has some question, please do so. Uh, oh no, you have been sharing my screen all along. So sorry about this. We've seen it and I'm going to share, where is it? Here. Sorry. 
Okay, I'm just going to conclude right now. Right, uh, very roughly speaking, and quickly speaking, it's a, you know, I spent, a, I spent a whole semester talking about this and I shrank all that stuff in, in one hour. So uh, basically we all need to understand that we need to transform our food system pretty quickly and pretty deeply. Like we need to do profound change. We could even call it a revolutionary change. And I'm not uh, joking about this. It's hard to explain, con convey the urgency of this issue in just one hour, but uh, please uh, bear in mind that uh, we need to kind of transform really deeply the way we are producing our food today. Uh, the impact of biodiversity is, is another disaster which we also have to address extremely quickly, um, but that's for another uh, time. Uh, life cycle assessment, I tried to make a demonstration to you on uh, use and interest of this. Of course, if you want to learn to do LCA, you need to take a, an LCA course, but it's, a, it's really a way to have a robust method to kind of quantify and get an understanding of all, the, all, the, all these impacts. And, and I think it, you can't really start having an impact on how you reduce or change your climate impact if you don't measure that. So uh, that's really the first step. So having an understanding on how to quantify the impact is really uh, essential to start talking about how do we change the way we are uh, producing and consuming our food. I think we can uh, hopefully with this type of tool, I mean, you saw a database is a little bit, uh, but if uh, some of you are excited about making an app or something like this, you could, uh, you know, you could integrate this very easily into a phone and try to imagine how we could make a, a, a guidance for consumers. Imagine uh, your mom or your dad uh, going shopping and they have their phone and they would just uh, scan the, the barcode of the type of food and they would be able to, uh, uh, to say, okay, uh, this is a red, so this is a very high climate impact or this is green, this is a very good climate impact and I'm going to uh, satisfy my kids because I'm uh, buying the food that has the lowest impact. So you can just start to imagine. And then of course, um, people will start changing the way they manufacture their food to try to reduce the impact associated with that to make sure that eventually their food will be ranked in a, in a green uh, category and therefore will be sold better uh, to, to their customer. So that's, that's all for me. Uh, just I hope that you, um, Enjoy this uh, this uh, moment uh, with, with me. And I'm uh, very uh, happy to take some uh, question if you have any. It looks like someone was asking, what are some small changes you recommend making to decrease the amount of food waste we make? Can you repeat the question at the end? Um, what are some small changes you can recommend making to decrease the amount of food waste we make? Fantastic question. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to give you an example uh, of my personal life. Um, one of the small things, I know that uh, bread is maybe not as central to your life as in, in my life as a French person, but uh, uh, I've stopped wasting a single, I never waste anything in the bread I bought for the last six years. So I, I, uh, if I don't eat all the bread, the fresh bread, it will go straight to the freezer and I will eat it and I will defreeze it as, as needed. I will either, uh, so that will require some energy, but I know that it will be uh, less uh, impactful than if I was just throwing the bread out. And if I leave it on the bench, it will be all dry and then it will not be good. If I still have some uh, bread out of that, I will, um, uh, mince it and use it uh, for cooking on other uh, food items. So I never ever, uh, so this is a super simple things, basically trying to make uh, a religious vow, a religious uh, uh, commitment that I will never throw bread away ever again. And you, you just uh, try to find ways to, to make sure that it, it's, it's happening that way. 
So it's things like this. Bread, I'm talking, I'm using the, the example of bread because bread is one of the most wasted products. Uh, bread and salad. A salad is also a very good one. Uh, another example, uh, if anybody eats asparagus. Asparagus, you have the white wine and you have the green wine, the green one. You want to make sure that you have the freshest asparagus, you buy them and most of them, the green one are coming from uh, Peru, flown by the way. Uh, but the best way to make sure that you don't waste it and to you reduce your, your food waste is by putting them in a big glass, exactly like you use a flour in a vase. And then you put that in a fridge and it will keep it in top condition forever, no waste whatsoever. Uh, what else? Do you want more example? I, I could carry on for hours, but uh, these are two examples that can help to reduce your, your food waste generation. It's very important uh, to, to, be, uh, to, to reflect a little bit. Uh, I give a whole course on, uh, on waste management and I give a, a whole lecture on just food waste. So, oh, maybe if you, another um, suggestion, there is a very good documentary that has been uh, made by uh, Anthony Bourdain uh, called Wasted. And it's the last documentary he made before uh, leaving this earth. Yeah, he, he died, he committed suicide. It's a very, very well-made documentary. I highly recommend it and you can uh, buy it for $55 or something like this. So it's a great uh, source. It's uh, located on Vimeo and probably Amazon as well. So you can uh, have a little bit more info about the food waste that we generate. Any other question? I think we are running out of time very soon. We have one more question about um, the, the revolution that you mentioned. Um, how long do you think it will realistically take for this revolution you talked about to happen? Is it realistic to assume it will happen in our lifetime? Oh yeah, it, it's, we're talking about, uh, I mean, I, I have uh, read a, an article uh, from a think tank called Rethink X. And, uh, and they estimate a complete um, collapse of the traditional agricultural system, mostly uh, cattle production. We are seeing today a tr complete transformation of alternative uh, to meat protein. And the future of protein, which is part of the future of food, but the future of protein will be using alternative protein, mostly coming from plant-based protein. And we see that happen. We see. Uh, you have all heard about Beyond Burger. You have uh, all heard about, uh, uh, yeah, there are like big uh, companies that are uh, being developed. They benefit from millions and millions and millions of uh, seed funding in capital investment. And uh, we can see that uh, IKEA is already changing the way they are providing their meatballs, which can be alternative meatball. We can hear uh, McDonald's. And the moment that McDonald's and uh, Burger Kings decide that it's uh, much better, uh, much more efficient and much cheaper to produce meat alternative, the cattle industry that we see today is uh, out of business. And uh, we will still see a niche, especially I'm talking in the US, I know uh, there is a big, big things around beef consumption but uh, it's gonna be a, a really strong um, uh, disruption of the existing system. And this has been amplified also by the COVID situation. We've seen uh, the biggest um, uh, uh, meat packaging company in the world. Uh, oops. The biggest uh, uh, packaging, meat packaging company in the world, packing company in the world, who had to stop because they had massive uh, uh, COVID outbreaks uh, in their factories. So uh, we, we're gonna see some uh, massive disruption on, the, on, that, uh, on that front, definitely. I, I'm very, actually for, uh, I'm very optimistic about it. It's not that I don't like meat, I love meat, uh, but we're gonna see a, a massive change and we're gonna see this, uh, my kids today that are behind this door, are uh, eating uh, plant-based burgers and they love it. And, and to convince my kid to eat something else than meat is a big, big, big achievement. And we're gonna see that happening and that's gonna be happening very fast. 
when you see the amount of funding that these companies are receiving, uh, they're going to be uh, some very, very profound uh, uh, transformation. Last example before I finish, um, I talked last week to a big company producing uh, milk products, uh, mostly milk, but also cheese and all that stuff. Uh, these guys are already starting to diversify and produce oat milk, even though they are 100% dairy milk company. So we can see already these guys have understood that something is happening and uh, yeah, there will be loser and winner, but uh, you will see a very profound uh, change in the way we are. Uh, and it might come from the US. It will be very interesting to, to, to follow that. Um, yeah. Any last question? I have all the time you want, huh, by the way, but uh, I just, it's starting to be dark here. So I need to put some more light. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, and I'm happy to let people go um, with our hour gone, but yeah, we can stick around a couple more minutes if people have other questions or if you want me to unmute you so you can ask, ask the wall. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. I'll go ahead and stop the recording.